Well, it's good to see everybody. Are you ready for Christmas? Yeah, 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 yeah. So as we begin today, I've got a really, really important question for you. Uh, and I just want you, and you've got to answer this in all honesty. Um, how many of you have all of your Christmas shopping done already? Let me see your hands. All right. Hold them high. Hold them high. Hold them high. All right. How many of you really despise those other people? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, you got your Christmas cards out? Anybody got Christmas cards? Do you even do Christmas cards anymore? You know, one of the things that's interesting about Christmas cards, they've kind of morphed out of like just a Christmas card into like a Christmas letter. You, you, you know what those letters, you ever receive one of those letters, you know? Somebody, they send you a card, but in the card, they've got this letter. And the letter is like, you know what? The kids are doing so great this year. You know, we've upgraded to this amazing house. We've taken all these trips and seen these amazing places and blah, blah, blah. So just Merry Christmas, everybody, you know? You're like, my life doesn't look anything like that, you know? <laughs> but in these Christmas letters, you'll never get a Christmas letter uh, that looks like this. It's been a great year. The kids are still taking all their meds. My credit card debt has doubled. I'm two months behind on rent. I had to put a restraining order on my ex. And the only vacation I had was when I spent two weeks at the Motel 6 because our sewer backed up and flooded half our house. Merry Christmas, everybody, you know. <laughs> no one ever says that. But when it comes to Christmas time, we really, we really want to be happy during Christmas, don't we? Like, Merry Christmas, happy, you know, happy holidays, everybody, joy to the world. That's what we want to be. But so oftentimes, Christmas time is a difficult season for people because it comes with a lot of financial stress uh, with gift buying and so forth. And sometimes it, this time of the year can actually magnify a person's feeling of loss or of loneliness and you got to go to all these parties, and everybody's acting so happy, and you've got to put on this happy face, and you just, you're just not feeling it on the inside. And you know, Christmas as a holiday can't change any of that. But something about Christmas can. So last week, we began this series called Light of the World, and we, we talk about how Jesus came in, and as Jesus came into the world, he brought light into a dark world. So we go from darkness to light when Jesus comes. And last week, we specifically talked about how because of Jesus, we can go from bitterness to love. And if you missed that message, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that message. And today, what I want to talk about is how we, at this time of the year, can go from sorrow to joy from sorrow to joy. And specifically today, we're going to look at the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 1 and beginning in verse 5. It's interesting how verse 5 begins in this passage. It says this, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, and we're going to talk about Herod in just a second, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, and I'm going to tell you about Nazareth in just a moment, a town in Galilee. Now, that is in northern Israel, all right, so that's where we are. Uh, he sent, this, uh, sent Gabriel there to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And so we get all the characters and all the people and all the places here, but here's what's going on. Herod was king in this time. The people of Israel know what it means to be sorrowful. In fact, they hadn't been a nation of their own for generations. They were ruled by Rome, and they weren't just ruled by Rome. They were ruled by a, a kind of a, a fake king that Rome put into the area of Israel and Galilee by the name of Herod. And he went by the title Herod the Great. And there was nothing great about Herod. Great, uh, Herod the Great was a, uh, just a brutal ruler. He ruled with an iron fist. Some of the things that he did, and you can read about Herod in history, were just, they were atrocious. And Mary's people, the people of Israel, felt the weight and the burden of being ruled by someone who was ruthless. And it wasn't just Herod. There were Roman soldiers going through that area also. Roman soldiers were brutal. They weren't nice like, you know, Maximus was in Gladiator, all right? That, the, they, they, weren't, they weren't that kind of uh, thing. They, if somebody was getting out of line... 
I mean, they, they wasted no time in punishment. They wasted no time in a swift action against them. The people of Israel were being taxed into poverty. Sometimes their land was being taken from them. This was not a happy time in the nation of Israel. And Nazareth, this little town, it just had about 500 people in it. Some archaeologists say between 500 and 1,000 people. It's a very, very small town. Uh, No one really thought much about it. Nazareth. It was kind of low on the totem pole. There wasn't anything quaint about, you know, Nazareth. It wasn't a place that you went to retire to, that's for sure. In fact, Nazareth was so uh, thought of lowly that when Nathan uh, was introduced to Jesus or was told about Jesus and the fact that he had come from Nazareth, Nathan says this, Nazareth Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now, you got to be kidding me. There's no way the Messiah can come from this podunk place. There's no way. In fact, uh, Nazareth was located about four miles from a Roman garrison. So a bunch of soldiers there. And it was off the beaten path. And so you, you didn't go through Nazareth on your way to anywhere. You had to, like, go out of your way to that. And so the, the Roman garrison was about four miles away. And when the, when the soldiers got a weekend off, guess where they went? They went to Nazareth because it was kind of a red light district. And so when their weekend off, they went to Nazareth for cheap wine and cheap women. And that was kind of Nazareth's claim to fame. And this is where... Mary grew up in this little podout place uh, that was off the beaten path. In fact, the town was so small, the town was so small, it's never even mentioned in the Old Testament because it was just, who would want to mention it? It didn't get a place on the map. Did you grow up someplace like that where your little town didn't have a place on the map? That's, That's Nazareth. It's so small, so forgotten, and people living there, understood the weight of the Roman Empire. They understood the weight of poverty. They understood the weight of being oppressed. And this is where Mary grows up, in this forgotten place, this forsaken place, seemingly. She's a young teenage girl, maybe 13 or 14 years old, in a very dangerous, unhappy place. And in this small town, as it was in many places in ancient times, marriages were arranged. A a, a family of of a young man would come and they would strike an arrangement with another family, with a young girl, and they would make this pledge. The, the, the fathers would make this pledge that my son will marry your daughter and, and vice versa. And so those, uh, those engagements were basically legally binding, and yet the marriage couldn't be consummated for sometimes up to a year. There was a betrothal period of time. Basically, legally, you were married, but you couldn't consummate the marriage until later on. And so this is Mary's lot. This is where she's growing up. No one notices Nazareth. No one wants to be in Nazareth except Roman soldiers on the weekend. It's off the beaten path. Mary's never getting out of Nazareth. If you're going to grow up there, that's where you're going to be. And all of a sudden, God shows up into her world, and the adventure begins. This is what it says in verse 28. The angel went to her, speaking of Mary, and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Excuse me? Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. That doesn't make any sense to Mary. And Mary, it says in the next verse, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Troubled means uh, exceedingly Go back to the last verse here. Trouble means exceedingly um, confused. Like, what in the world? Disoriented. And wondered, it just simply means she's scrambling to make sense of everything. It's like, what in the world? I, 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 I'm confused. I'm, I'm dazed. Verse 30 goes on. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. This is the second time that he says this. And he goes on. Here's the message. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And as, as, he, as the angel speaking, if you're Mary, can you imagine how your mind was racing? Like, what in the world is all of this about? I mean, have you ever had such news come to you so quickly it was hard to process? I'm sure this is what Mary's experiencing. I mean, this is a season in an in a, in a, in era of history where women weren't any more than just basically property of men. And yet, this angel comes to her with all of this wonderful news. She's like, what in the world? And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Are you kidding me? An angel shows up. And, she, and he starts speaking to this girl. And, and Mary understands. She, she understands some things. And she says, wait a minute. How will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? Like, I, you know, all of this other stuff. But, but I didn't hear anything after you will give birth to a son. Like, I, that's not happening. Like, I know enough about the birds and the bees to know that this is anatomically impossible. Because I've never been with a man. This, you know, so how, how will this be? That, that can't happen. And I wonder if this question about how is not just like this is physically impossible, like I don't, all this other stuff, but I, I, I didn't hear anything after that. But why are you here? Like, why did you show up here? Right? Like, why come to me? I mean, of all the places you could go, I mean, Nazareth? Really? Why, why come to me? It's almost as if she's saying, hey, look around, Mr. Angel Man. <laughs> you know, I live in the armpit of Israel. This place is a dump. The Son of God can't come from here. I, I don't know. I mean, you, you, <laughs> you got lost along your journey, but this isn't happening for a lot of different reasons. And so the angel answers her. I'll tell you how. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he goes on, he says, hey, hey this is, I'm not finished yet. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God. Or able, will ever fail. And I love how Mary, she listens to all of this. I'm sure at this point, you know, her, her mind is racing. Her eyes are darting around. You know, blood pressure is probably shot up. You know, adrenaline's pumping through her veins. And yet, as, as she takes all of this in, I love her next answer. It just simply says this. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. I love how the King James says this. It says, it says, may it be to me as you have said. May it be to me as you have said. What, if that's what you want, that's very song. That's, very, um, that's, that's fine with me. And then in verse 46, so she goes to Elizabeth uh, to hear about Elizabeth's deal, and they kind of celebrate. And after Mary gets there, this is what it says. And Mary said, and when it says she said this, a lot of people think that she sung this. And so sometimes this is called Mary's song or the Magnificat. And I don't know what kind of song it was. Maybe it was like a, a Broadway song with dancing, you know, and, and, and glitz. Maybe it was like a country song with a little swain. Maybe uh, it was some other kind of thing. But whatever it was, I'm pretty sure it wasn't like any Cardi B song ever, ever, ever. Because she goes on and she says, and, and, and what's important about all of this is this. Don't, don't, don't miss this. In the middle of this dark time, this little girl who's, who's lost in history, in this little armpit of the Roman Empire, ruled by a wannabe king, you know, brutal and, and all, this little podout town, town, in the middle of all of this, in this dark time, it, for this nobody girl, she goes from sorrow to joy. She goes from sorrow to joy. And she says this, my soul glorifies the Lord. Glorify means to make large, to magnify, 
to praise. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of servant. This word rejoices means to be overfilled with joy, to be overcome with joy. Now wait a minute. How in the world can a little teenage girl in the armpit of Nazareth that's a red light district, all of a sudden say, you know what? My heart and my soul is overfilled with joy. She's not been overfilled with joy. There's nothing in her life to make her be overjoyed. She can't magnify God in this way. I mean, it's, this is just an impossible situation. But all of a sudden, she goes from where she was to a place of overflowing joy. And she goes on and she says this. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. You say, well, James, how in the world has she gone from like this sorrow to this joy? And you might think, well, you know what? Having a baby probably helps. I mean, you remember, for those of you who have, uh, who, who have children, you remember when you got news of your first pregnancy, you're like, oh, that's wonderful. Maybe, hopefully you thought that was wonderful. Um, at least your kids hope that you think that was wonderful, right? And it's like, hey, we're having a baby. This is so good. But this is not like a joyful news necessarily. For her at this point in her life to be, uh, you know, have this news of being pregnant is not really great. This didn't solve any problems. In fact, it it created problems in her life. It didn't resolve anything. It created problems. I mean, what in the world was Joseph, her fiancé, was going to think? Because they hadn't been together yet. They may not have even met each other at this point. And so she has to tell Joseph, or the word has to get back to Joseph, hey, I'm pregnant. And he's probably thinking, what Roman soldier? Why did you do this? See, this is, not gonna, this, is, this is not how you start your marriage off. We're not yet, you know, we haven't consummated our marriage, but oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. That's not the way you want to start your marriage off. What are the people in the town going to think? Everybody thought maybe highly of her before, but now they're going to say, oh, she's just like one of them. Uh-huh, I know. How's that going to do? Her family was probably going to be embarrassed. You see, Mary's, at this news, Mary's future didn't get better. It got more complicated. This wasn't something that's like, oh, this is going to be awesome. This is going to complicate her future, and it's going to make things uncertain for her. And so the question comes, from where is her joy coming? From where is her joy coming? Well, I think it comes from a place in verse 46. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You see, she realizes that God has noticed her. Nazareth, like I said, is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. She's probably thinking, how did God even know we existed? Have you ever felt like that? Like, how would God even notice me? And yet all of a sudden, guess what? God does notice her. All of a sudden, she realizes that she is not a nameless person. That God sent his angel to her. He noticed her. God thinks about her. He sees her exactly where she's at. He knows exactly what's happened in her life. And it's not just that uh, God sees her and that he's mindful of her. There's more to it than that. I think her joy flowed from a part of the story that we tend to misunderstand or will overlook because back in verse 30, this is what it says, But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, some people think that this is uh, 
this is trying to indicate that there was something special about Mary, that she was unique in some way, and that is why God chose her to be the mother of Jesus, that she was just better than everyone else, and so she was the most pure and the most, you know, whatever, and so that's why God chose her. Very special, very unique. Maybe she'd never sinned before, people think. But I don't think that's what this verse is saying. I don't think that's why she's favor. You see, this special phrase does not mean that she was special or better than anyone else because the word favor simply means to receive grace. That's what the word favor means. Hey, you found favor or you're favored from the Lord. In other words, you've received grace from God and grace means gift. That's what the word grace means. It means gifts. And gifts are free, aren't they? They're not earned. Gifts aren't given because you're better than everybody else. Gifts are given because they're just gifts. If you've earned it, if you're better than everybody else, guess what? It's not a gift. And if favor means to receive grace and grace is a gift, then God is coming to Mary. She's not more special than anybody else. He's just saying, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing you and you are recipient of my grace. It's as if God has looked down on you with favor and he's extending to you his grace. You are the recipient of God's grace. This is what the angel is saying. You're the recipient of God's grace. God is with you, Mary. God is with you. You know, we get two words interchanged and they mean different things, happiness and joy. Sometimes we talk about uh, happiness and we think we mean joy or joy and happiness. We use those interchangeably in our culture, but those two words aren't the same. Happiness is something that, you know, when happy things happen, I'm happy. When good things happen, I'm happy. So happiness really comes from our circumstances. Like I get a promotion, I'm happy, you know, you know, something something good happens and that brings me happiness. Happiness, it's circumstantial, but joy is different, you see. Joy is something that comes, uh, a deep sense of well-being despite our circumstances. There's this sense of well-being, like, you know, things on the outside may be good, they may be bad, but internally, inside, I'm okay. There's a sense of well-being on the inside. You see, joy comes from within the soul. And joy can be experienced despite the pain that you go through, despite the sorrow or the circumstances that you're in. Mary wasn't going from sad to happy. Mary was going from sorrow to joy. She's going from sorrow to joy. You see, When Mary experienced all of this, something welled up on the inside of her. Something clicked like it had never clicked before. You see, Mary's joy comes when she's told, you know what, you're highly favored. And she realizes that God sees her. She realizes that God knows exactly where she's at, that he cares about her, that he knows her name, and that he is with her. You see, God's favor did not result in better circumstances in Mary's life. Things did not get better for Mary. You understand that, right? God's favor does not result in better circumstances. And yet, that's what we think. You see, when Mary found news that she was going to be with child, that she was going to be having a baby, she realized that she was going to be shunned because no one's going to believe this story. They're going to be, believe the worst about her. And she can say, no, 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 you don't understand. It's not like that. Sure, it's not like that. No one's going to believe her. This is going to create conflict in her family. I mean, her parents are not going to be happy about this. Her siblings, if she had any, and I'm sure she did, they're not going to be happy about this. I mean, everyone's going to look down with her on disdain. 
Joseph's family is not going to be happy about this. They're going to be mad at the entire other family. Like, how in the world would you let your daughter do something like this to dishonor my son? Joseph's thinking, what in the world, Mary? (laughs) Seriously, couldn't you just wait? This is not creating anything good. And then, you know, she's going to have to travel, so... They're, they're going to get basically kicked out of the nest here. She's going to have to go travel from Nazareth in northern Israel all the way down to southern Israel to where Bethlehem is to have this baby. She's riding on a donkey. That's not going to be easy, but that's what she's going to do. She's going to have this baby outside, of, you know, outside basically in a, in a, in a barn, a, a very small barn with a bunch of farm animals around. That's not, that's not what you hope for. It's like, wait, 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 wait. I thought this was going to be the son of God, the son of the most high. And I just know something about the son of the most high, that kind of thing. Those people aren't born in a barn. There's some luxury around most high. Isn't that what you would expect? Like if this is going to be so, oh, this is going to be, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. And then after the birth King Herod the Great, the terrible, would be would find out, would hear news about this Jesus being born, and he would hear that this Jesus was some kind of royalty. He didn't understand it all, but he just understood enough that he wasn't going to have anybody to challenge his rule and reign in Israel. And so he gives out an edict that all the children under two years of age were to be slaughtered. And when Mary and Joseph hear that Herod has put out this kill order on all babies all throughout his, uh, the area of his reign, they fled to Egypt as refugees. So here is a 13 or 14-year-old girl with a probably a little bit older young man, maybe upper teens, maybe early 20s. They're, all they've known is Nazareth. You don't travel around much if you go to Nazareth. Now they're in Bethlehem, and now they're fleeing into Egypt, another, a different country. They don't know the customs there. They don't know anything there. They have no family, no relatives, no one to stay with. This is not easy in ancient times. It wouldn't be easy today, but it is not easy in ancient times. But this is the, this is the path that Mary's life has taken. And then, you know, they would come out after that, and, and Jesus, as he was growing up, after 12 years of old age, we hear nothing about Jesus' father, Joseph. So what happened to Joseph? We don't know. Maybe he was killed in a work-related accident. Maybe the pressure got too much, and he left Mary and his other children. But from 12 years old on, we believe that Mary was a single parent, raising Jesus as a single parent. Those of you who are single parents know how difficult that is. It's just difficult. This is not easy for Mary, and it's not easy for Jesus and his half-brothers and sisters because we're, we find in the Gospels that the, the relationship between Jesus and his brothers and his siblings was contentious at best. In fact, at one point, they, decide, they, they tried to encourage Jesus to go down into Jerusalem because they'd heard that people were looking to kill him, and they were saying, you should go down to Jerusalem, Jesus. We think that'd be a great idea for you. And Mary has, as a single parent perhaps, she has to manage all of this tension. You see, God's favor did not result in better circumstances in Mary's life. You understand that, right? But we think if someone's favored of God, things go well for them. Mary would say, no, 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 no. Just because you're favored by God doesn't mean that anything is easy for you. My life did not get easy. It got really difficult because ultimately Mary would go through all of those experiences and then, and then, and then she would see this one that she gave birth to, mutilated by Rome and crucified on a cross. Her circumstances weren't great. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Here's why. Because whoever you are and whatever you are going through right now, whatever troubles you're experiencing, whatever pain you're experiencing in your life right now, whatever sadness that you have or that you're going through, 
I want you to understand this. God is in this place, and he is saying the same thing to you that he said to Mary. You are highly favored, and God is with you. You are highly favored, and God is with you. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. And yet, you're highly favored. Have you ever thought of yourself as highly favored? Have you ever thought, I'm highly favored? Maybe you think, if you were, no, I'm not highly favored, James, because if I were highly favored, things would be going differently in my life. I, you know, I would, I, I would be something special. I, I, I would have privileges in my life. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus highly favored by God? I would say that he was. And yet, how did his life turn out? They hung him on a cross. You see, God's favor and your circumstances don't mean that, hey, your circumstances are going to be great. Jesus had opposition his entire life life. And yet he was favored by God. And so I believe that God would say to you the same thing that he says to Mary from the angel. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You are highly favored. You understand this. You are highly favored from the king and the creator of the universe. Not because of what you have done. Not because you're so much better than everyone else. Because you've lived your life, you know, cleaner than everyone else. But because he knows you. He created you. He formed you. He knows what makes you tick. He's intimately aware of who you are and you have his favor. You have his grace on you. He cherishes you as a son, as a daughter. So, you're highly favored. I want you to turn to somebody right now. I just want you to say to them, you are highly favored and God is with you. Go ahead, turn to somebody and say, you are highly favored and God is with you. Now, here's, here's the next thing I want you to do. I want you just to, you know, just kind of tap the person next to you and say, guess what? I'm highly favored and God's with me. Go ahead. <laughs> guess what? God. I said tap, not hit, all right? I see some of this going on. No, no, no. And maybe you're thinking, maybe you're thinking, hey, whoa, 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 time out. If I'm highly favored and God is with me, then why is my life so hard? If I'm highly favored and God is with me, why is my life so hard? Like if God is with me, then he sh this thing shouldn't be this difficult. Or why aren't I happy or at least happier than I am? Because here's the deal. God's favor... And God's presence are not meant to bring us happy circumstances in this world. God's favor and God's presence are not meant to bring us happy circumstances in this world. Instead, they are meant to bring us joy despite our circumstances. And we think, if God were with me, my circumstances would change. And God's saying, circumstances is about happiness. Joy is about something completely different than your circumstances. Joy has to do with I know you, I am with you, and my grace is extending to you every single moment. Because, see, God wants you to have joy regardless of what is happening in your life, regardless of the circumstances. You see, Jesus was very realistic about all of this. Jesus said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In me you may have peace. You can rest. 
because things are going to go well, Jesus? No. Because in this world, you will have trouble. Wait a minute, Jesus. I thought you said I could have peace because I, I equate peace with things are going easy. No. You can have peace in the midst of trouble. So take heart. I've overcome the world. I have overcome the world. You see, trouble is not optional, but joy is possible. Trouble is not optional in life. If you're looking for a trouble-free life and you're thinking that following Jesus is going to get you that, that's, it's just not. But joy is possible regardless of the trouble that you experience. Because joy is not about your circumstances. It's about something that comes from within. It's a deep sense of well-being inside the Apostle Paul wrote these words in, to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome, let me tell you, they understood the oppression of Rome. They understood how it was not easy to be a Christian. This is what he says, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have, now listen, look at this, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. There have been seasons uh, in my marriage with Angie, we've been married uh, since 1991. There have been seasons in my marriage with Angie where it is, it's been difficult. In fact, there have been times in our marriage where we felt like we've been, we're two strangers living in the same house. And I don't say that as a cliche. I mean that we've been there. And during those times, um, when she and I would talk, I, I would say to her, look, I, you know what? If things between you and me aren't right, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. Like everybody else in the world can think I'm wonderful, things at work can be going great. I mean, everything, I could be driving a nice car. All the other circumstances in my life could be great. But if you and I aren't right, none of that other stuff matters. In other words, what I was saying, if there's not peace between me and you, Nothing else matters. And I'm just here to tell you, if there's not peace between you and God, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And so, through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace or into this favor with God. That's what it means. We've gained access... uh, to this with grace in which we now stand. We stand in it right now. You see, your identity, your identity is not in your circumstances. It is in the God who sees you and pours out his grace through Jesus Christ. So oftentimes we identify how things are going by our circumstances and we put our identity in our circumstances and we think, man, I'm amazing because everything's going well. Or you may think, I'm, I'm rotten because nothing in my life is going well. I must not be valued by God. And just because things are going rotten in your life does not mean that God does not love you and that you are not valued by God. Things did not go well in Mary, the mother of Jesus. She had a very, very difficult life. And yet the angel said, you are highly favored by God. You see, don't wrap your identity up in your circumstances because they will change. And when your circumstances change... What do you have? I hope you had what Mary had. This inner sense of well-being and peace with God. My circumstances have gotten terrible, and yet I'm, I'm good with God. And just because my circumstances are bad does not mean that God doesn't love me or that he doesn't know about me. He is there with me through it all. And so Paul continues. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. What? He's been drinking. (laughs) Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that. We know that. We know that our sufferings will go away sometime. 
our sufferings will be diminished at some point. We just know that there's something good coming, right? That this thing is going to change. That's not what Paul says. Because we know that, what do we know? Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And you may say, you know what? I'm really not interested in perseverance. I'm really not interested in character. I just want better circumstances. And you're opting for the easy way out. And what God is saying is, wait a minute, you got to understand. In this world, you will have trouble. But that trouble that you're experiencing will actually produce something that's valuable in your life. Perseverance, character, hope. And why is that important? Because hope, he goes on to say in the next verse, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured out into our hearts. I know, regardless of what's happening around me, that God loves me and that God is there for me. Even in the midst of my difficult circumstances. Bottom line, simply this. I am favored by God and he is with me. I am favored by God and he is with me. You are favored by God And that God is with you, and here's how I know, because 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, a baby was born, and that baby was not just from God, that baby was God in the flesh. And that baby was born because God loves you. That baby, Jesus, is God's gift to you, his gift of grace to you. That baby's name, Jesus, means God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He's with you. And regardless of your circumstances, his favor rests on you. His grace is extended to you. Now, I've got a question. His grace is extended to you not because, not because you're good, not because you're better than the person next to you, not because you're, you know, not because of anything that you have done. You're not favored by God compared to everybody else because you're better than everybody else. He extends his favor and he extends his favor and grace through Jesus Christ to you simply because he loves you. He knows your name. He knows what you're going through. You think he's forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what your life is going through right now. He knows where you grew up. He knows your family of origin. He knows all of that stuff. And he's always known. And he loves you. Do you believe that? Let me ask a better question. Are you willing to believe that? Because here's the thing, you you may be listening to this right now and thinking, I've never believed that in my life. My life has been such a, God, there's no way. If I were favored by God, this would all look different. No. And Mary's life proves it. Mary's life proves it. So here's the thing. Would you open yourself up to God's love today? Would you, would you open your heart up to him and receive his grace? Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've gone, maybe you've just gone to church and you've grown up maybe in a religious environment or maybe you've been away from church for a long time. Maybe you've never been to church. In this moment right now, for the first time, You can literally open up your heart and realize, you know what? My circumstances say nothing about God's favor to me or his love for me. They say nothing about it. It didn't say anything about his love for Mary. Her life was difficult. Her entire life was difficult. 
And if it was difficult for the mother of Jesus, if it was difficult for Jesus himself, why do we think as followers of Jesus it will be different for us? No. Your circumstances don't say anything about God's love for you. What says something to you about God's love is Christmas itself. Jesus came because God loves you. And you can open your heart up right now and just say, God, I received your gift, the gift of Jesus. I'm opening my life up to you right now. This is what you can say. I'm opening my life up to you right now. And I invite you in. And I understand that inviting you in doesn't mean that my circumstances are going to change. But inviting you in does mean, does mean, does mean, does mean that I now, for the first time, have peace with you. And when you have peace with God, your maker, your creator, the one to whom you will give an account, it's all good. It's all good. Because one day, if you have peace with God, one day you will stand before him and he will say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. I know it was hard. I know it was difficult. I know you questioned and I know you wondered, but I was always with you. Enter into the joy of my rest. That can be yours this Christmas. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, I receive you as the gift of God, and I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Here's what I want you to do. There's a truth in all of this to repeat. I want you to do this every day this week, multiple times. I want you to repeat this truth. I'm favored by God, and he is with me. When you're tempted to think, oh, Just say this, I'm favored by God and he is with me. Say it out loud with me right now. I am favored by God and he is with me. One more time. I am favored by God and he is with me. Say it all week long. And not just say that, but here's a prayer that you can pray. Here's a prayer that you can pray. Father, thank you for your favor It's hard sometimes to pray. Thank you for your favor, your gift of grace to me. Thank you for seeing me, knowing me, caring for me, and being with me. Regardless of your circumstances, this is your prayer. Because you know, you know, you know, God sees you, God knows you, he loves you, he is with you with you. Life is hard. Trouble, inevitable. Happiness comes and happiness goes. Trouble comes and trouble goes. But joy is possible through the favor and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He loves you, he knows you, and he is with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.